So, um, some things Peter said in our reading this week caused me to think back to our very first meeting in September. Uh, I think we have quite a few new people here since then, but um, those of you that are here may recall that I introduced each speaker, and then each speaker took a few minutes to give us some information on the Bible as a whole. Kind of like what you do when you go to the Costco book section, you pick up a book, you look at the front and the back and the flaps to just get an idea of what the book is about. Um, <clears throat> so, Kim started by uh, giving us a background on the Old and New Testament and how they're tied together. She gave facts about the Bible, but she also challenged us to apply what we read because the Bible isn't just full of facts to learn and know, but it's applicable to our lives. Then Michelle talked about the some characters that we were going to be introduced to right at the beginning of our reading. We needed to be familiar with the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Zealots. Uh, those were key players, so she shared um, stuff about that. And then Sharon talked about the Bible being the true and inerrant word of God, and she told us um, that scripture was canonized. She mentioned that Jesus in Luke 24 uh, confirmed the canonization of the Old Testament by saying, everything must be fulfilled what is written about me. She also explained how Jesus, in a way, pre-authenticated the New Testament before it was written by talking about how the Holy Spirit would come and remind the apostles what they learned from him so that they could go out and preach his words. She did a great job nine months ago. Now we come to 2 Peter, and I find the things he says hold a theological punch here nearly at the end of our reading, nine months later. I felt a prompting to review Sharon's topic again about canonization in order to keep it fresh in our minds, giving us a clear understanding of what canonized scripture is so that we can be ready to give a reason for our hope, like Peter said in our reading this week. Do you remember he said, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Someday, someone, an atheist or even a deconstructing Christian, will challenge your belief on the accuracy and the inerrancy of the Bible. Now, I've talked about Satan's tactics before. He will try to either take verses away from the Bible or add verses to the Bible or get rid of the whole thing altogether. Why does Satan attack the Bible so much? Because it is the word of God. And he needs to discount that power any way he can. So, the atheist comes to you and asks, why do you believe that the Bible is so special when it was put together 300 years after the supposed, uh oh, excuse me, uh, Christine is calling me. I wonder if she wants to get a hold of you. Okay. <laughs> Zoom girl. Okay. with that. Okay, the atheist says to you, all skeptically, why do you believe? that the Bible is special when it was put together 300 years after the supposed life of Jesus. It was just a group of men who got together and decided what was in and what was out. One reason why I love history so much is because it helps explain how we got to where we are today. I've heard my husband tell this famous Papa story a couple of times, and I think it fits in so nicely here to help illustrate the point. So I'm going to share the story. A newlywed man um, watches his wife cut an inch off from both ends of the meat of her pot roast before putting it in the oven. He thought it was odd, but watched her do this several times during their first part of the marriage. Finally, one day he asks her why she did that. She responded, that is how my mom and grandmother did it. That's how you're supposed to cook it. The husband decided at a family reunion to ask the grandmother why she cooked her pot roast that way. She said she learned it from her mom. 
Well, the great grandmother was at the reunion as well, so the young man made his way over to her. Great grandmother Mabel, your daughter, your granddaughter, and your great granddaughter all make their pot roast like you do. Tell me, why do you cut your pot roast one inch on each side before cooking it? <laughs> the great grandmother laughed and said, We, well, we used to be very poor. I didn't own a lot of cookware. I cut the ends off so the meat would fit into the pan. <laughs> If you forget or never learn history, you will have a hard time countering an atheist pointed question. A simple answer to the atheist question is because that's what I was told was true. It may not suffice. He won't be satisfied with that answer and you may become skeptical yourself. <laughs> Maybe he's right. Maybe it was just a bunch of men putting it together. You may experience cognitive dissonance. <laughs> I tell the pot roast story to illustrate the importance of understanding the canonization of scripture so that you fight off Satan's blows of getting you to question the validity of the Bible being God's authoritative word in your life. So here we go. Canon. C-A-N-N-O-N -N -N is a big gun. But C-A-N-O-N, just one N, is a law or rule of doctrine or discipline enacted by a council or other competent ecclesiastical authority. So when scripture is said to be canonized, it is authoritative in matters of faith and practice set in place by a council or one in ecclesiastical authority. The Old Testament was a collection of books that was revealed um, by God over a period of a thousand years, from 1400 BC to 425 BC. Jesus affirms the authority of the Old Testament often, and uh, for example, he says, have you not read what God said to you? Or God said, and he referred to Old Testament scripture. The Old Testament is separated from the New Testament by a 450-year period known as the intertestimonial period. Nothing new was revealed to man during that time. You might remember when I talked about Alexander the Great conquering that Judean area 334 years before Christ. That brought a strong Greek influence into the area. Eventually, hold on, Right. Um, eventually, trade, culture, and politics caused the Jewish people to need to learn Greek. Some Jewish scholars then translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek so that the new generations of Greek-speaking Jews could read the Torah. That translated version of the Hebrew Torah to Greek is called the Septuagint. By the time of Jesus, the Old Testament canon had been closed for 425 years. Nothing new could be added to it. The new Greek translation of the Torah was in use, and Jesus and other New Testament authors even quoted from the Septuagint. The New Testament, unlike the Old, was revealed over a much shorter period of time, a 60-year period versus 1,000 years, from 3380 to 180. When did that canon of scripture get closed? Well, back to that atheist argument from the New Testament was being put together by a group of men at a council over 300 years after the supposed books were written. Um, it's true, it is said that the books were ratified or confirmed in 397 AD by the Council of Carthage um, that council listed 27 books of the New Testament as well as 39 books of the Old Testament as canonized scripture. But let's talk about that. When I hear the atheist question of the group of men putting the Bible together, I imagine a group of bishops coming to Carthage, which is North Africa, um, which is at the very top of the continent. So picture Italy, the boot, kicking Sicily, and Sicily rolling over, it would hit Tunisia which is uh, where the ancient um, Carthage was located. It was 
very centrally located by boat for bishops to come from all over to a council. Perhaps some bishops from Egypt came, maybe some from Jerusalem. I don't think any bishops from uh, Rome were there because in the document from the council, they said they wanted the approval of the people up in Rome, so what, uh, their ratification. So I picture all those bishops coming with trunks filled with old parchments. They collected from their hometowns, spread them on the tables, and compared notes with each other. The leader of the council stands, gets their attention, and says, okay, We've read everything, say yay or nay when I hold up the letter. Whoever gets the majority of votes, well, the book will make it into the whole book. So, okay, so let's start with Matthew's Gospel. Yay or nay? Yay? Okay, I'll put it in the keep file. How about the book of Barnabas? Yay or nay? No. Nay? Okay, I'm going to stick it over here um, in, the, in the reject pile. Okay, men, stay focused. We have a lot to get through. What about Hebrews? Yay or nay? We are not sure. Let's circle back on that. You know. <laughs> so, um, if I was trying to disprove the authority of Scripture, I would certainly promote that idea. If it was true that God allowed His Word to be canonized by a group of unknown men some 300 years after the death of John, the apostle. Could I trust those men who approved the correct writings of Scripture? Who knows? Thankfully, that's not how Scripture was canonized, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. Fortunately for us, we have those early church fathers who wrote things that have become external evidence for us that provides proof for us to think differently than the skeptics.
writings were equal in authority to Old Testament prophecy. It's not the writer's interpretation. It's not of human origin. It was from God through the Holy Spirit. And Peter is saying, that's us too. We have the prophetic message. It's not our interpretation. It didn't come from us. It came from the Holy Spirit. You will do well to pay attention to it. So we can see that Peter canonized his own writings and writings of ones who was writing for him. And that would include Mark and um, his gospel. After all, Peter was the competent ecclesiastical authority to be able to do so since Jesus told him he was to be the rock on which the church was, uh, Christ's church would be built. That's in Matthew 16. In addition to Peter, Paul was a competent ecclesiastical authority who canonized his own writings. In every letter of his, you might remember how he established his credibility as a bondservant of Jesus Christ, an apostle of the Lord, set apart to preach the gospel. He canonizes his own writings when he says in Galatians, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. He says this about the word he preached, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. He says that in Hebrews. And in his second letter to Timothy, he says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So Timothy preached the word. Or actually, the first part is chapter 3, 16, and the Timothy preached the word is chapter 4, too. Paul, by the authority given to him by God, canonizes his own writings. But we also see Peter confirming the canonization of Paul's writings in what we read this week. Second Peter 3, 16 says, Some parts of Paul's letters are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Peter had all of Paul's writings. He knew, we know Paul's letters um, were passed from town to town, according to Colossians 4.16, and that would be up in Asia Minor. Yet, it could be assumed they were copied and passed to Peter, who always had been down in the Judea region. And he had read all of Paul's letters, so they had been copied. I think that's so cool to think about. Peter had them all, read them all. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. So Peter affirms Paul's writings and grouped them in with all canonized scripture. Likewise, Paul confirms Luke's writings as scripture. He writes his letter to Timothy at the end of his ministry, which is about 64 AD, saying, For scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out grain, and... The worker deserves his wages. That's 1 Timothy 5.18. Well, how does that affirm Luke's writings? Paul quotes both Deuteronomy 25.4 on that first part and Luke 10.7 on that second part. Paul is holding Luke's writings as scripture by saying, for scripture says, and then he quoted Luke. Remember, Luke was a companion of Paul for many years. It is thought that the Gospel of Luke was already in circulation four or five years before that letter to Timothy. That means Luke's Gospel and Acts had been canonized before the death of Paul. Isn't that fascinating? So Paul and Peter canonized their writings and Luke's before they died in the mid-60s. What about John? Well, I read a theologian named Fred Coulter, who has translated the New Testament from Greek to English. He believes that official canonization with the final arrangements of the books of the entire New Testament was accomplished by the Apostle John in 96 to 99 AD. We are almost to Revelation in our reading plan, but let me read the very interesting way John ends his book. He writes, I warn anyone who hears the 
the words of this prophecy, of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from the scroll, scroll of prophecy, he will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. That is Jesus and John testifying to the canonization of this prophecy. I personally thought that you could, you just couldn't alter the book of Revelation without getting struck by a plague. But actually, John goes much further than that when referring to the scroll of prophecy. You got to look at the first chapter of Revelation to see what John was testifying to in this scroll. Chapter 1, verse 2 says, He, Jesus, made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Coulter, the theologian, points out that everything John saw includes the visions he wrote down. To the word of God that would include everything in the Old and New Testament, which is all the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus, which is contained in all four Gospels and all the letters of Paul. As said by Coulter, once the task was finished of writing Revelation, the New Testament book, with its last revelation, was added to the Old Testament. Thus, the full revelation of God to mankind was completed and canonized by the disciple whom Jesus loved, the Apostle John, and it was closed. All that to say, most of what we have in the New Testament was immediately thought of as scripture if the writing came from an apostle that was chosen by Jesus himself or a close companion of an apostle chosen by Jesus, such as Mark and Luke. We understand that the original apostles canonized their own writings. In addition, use of those writings as Holy Scripture was referred to by our early church fathers, which is what we refer to as external evidence. For example, Irenaeus, born in 140 AD, who was acquainted with Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Baptist, uh, John the disciple, says this: <laughs> Since therefore the tradition from the apostles does thus exist in the church and is permanent among us, let us revert to the scriptural proof furnished by those apostles who did also write the gospel, in which they recorded the doctrine regarding God, pointing out that our Lord Jesus Christ is the truth and that no lie is in Him. In addition to Arrhenius, we have Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen all wrote the New Testament written scriptures canonized by the apostles as holy, the voice of God, inspired and divine and true. And true. These church fathers all lived prior, saying these things prior to the Council of Carthage in 397 AD. So back to that question, the atheist is... Um, saying so accusationally about the Bible, and when it was canonized 300 years after the fact, what are you going to say? Councils come together to make things clear for others as to what is true and what is heresy. They do not come together to create. An example of that is the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, I have mentioned a couple of times. 300 bishops came together to clarify the Trinity. They did not create the idea of the Trinity. No, they affirmed the Trinity. The affirmation was needed at that time to combat false teaching that was gaining momentum. The false teaching that Jesus was divine but not equal to God. Their clarification to the masses, all 300 of those bishops went back and, and firmly established the orthodoxy or correct Christian belief. It was not created at the Council of Nicaea. Likewise, the Council of Carthage didn't come together to create canonized scripture. They were clarifying what already was canonized by the apostles themselves. This was needed because of the false writings that were getting into circulation and causing confusion. Books that were not accepted into the canon were termed apocryphal. The 
word apocrypha means things put away or things hidden. The books now called the Apocrypha had never been held as authoritative scripture by any of those bishops, even before the council. The council came together to ratify the only books that could be read in church. The others could not be read in church. So that is what you're going to tell your atheist friend. Both Old and New Testament canonized scriptures said to be closed. God has revealed everything we need to know to be saved and live a holy life, according to what we read in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, 3, and 4 this week. No more books could be added. God will not be adding any new revelation. It is complete. Therefore, a closed canon implies that there are no apostles or prophets today who are receiving new messages from God. God may reveal himself to us in individual ways, but not in new ways outside of what the Bible says. We have a great many preachers and Bible teachers today, but if anyone claims to be receiving new messages from God or assumes authority on par with the Bible with new revealed teaching, you must put up the red flag. That person will lead people astray. Be prepared for an answer on that one as well. When you hear a friend say they love their new church that is doing something new and different from Orthodox Christianity. And here ends your history lesson.